one that I'm particularly interested in is Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's something that I've been um, researching for a while. I'm, I'm about to get published, thank, thankfully, um, soon. Congratulations. Soon. Thank you. But, um, is this a review paper? Yeah. Oh, please and, send it And it to happens me. to do with um, a gene called APOE4. Um, and I, I, I found out that I have one copy of this, of this allele. And yeah. when I found that out years ago, I was like, it's, it's probably the biggest um, risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's, late onset um, Alzheimer's disease besides age. Yeah, so, so I think one of those alleles, it's about sort of a two to three fold risk. Two to three fold. If you have two of them, it's like an eight to 12. Yeah, it's like, it's pretty bad. And yeah. a quarter, 25% of the population in the United States has at least one allele. Yeah. So it's definitely, in a, and just because you have it doesn't mean you're necessarily gonna get Alzheimer's disease. That's right. Not everyone with it has it, but there's huge interaction with you know, diet and lifestyle. Probably the biggest lifestyle interaction with this gene is sleep. Yeah, uh, and so that was um, that was where I became very interested in, in how sleep affects the brain and how it affects you know Alzheimer's disease and, and all that. So I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about that. And, yeah. So we've been doing a lot of this work. We have a, a large um, research program here at um, at UC Berkeley at the Sleep Center that is devoted to aging and Alzheimer's disease and. Um, we've been very fortunate to get all, um, many grants from the NIH here to study this. Um, I think the, the story is, is fascinating because it's a bi-directional relationship between um, sleep and the pathology that we know is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So in Alzheimer's disease, there are at least two protein culprits that we believe are underlying the brain pathology that seems to create this thing called Alzheimer's. One of them is a sticky toxic protein called beta amyloid that accumulates in these clumps outside of brain cells. Um, and that creates these amyloid plaques um, that seem to be correlated with your disease risk and disease severity. The other is a protein that we know probably less about, which is a protein called tau protein. And that sits inside of cells and it creates a support structure for communicating and funneling many of the critical ingredients up and down your nerve cells to keep them in rude health. And during Alzheimer's disease, that protein starts to sort of fall apart and dismantle and you get these sort of tau um, tangles um, and the, the, the structure of the nerve cell and its, its ability to transport um, all of the ingredients that it needs to operate starts to collapse and fail. It's like a tunnel collapsing down. Um, so one of the discoveries that we made um, back in 2013 was that I was looking at the distribution of this sticky toxic protein called amyloid in the human brain. And what's fascinating is that it doesn't build up in the brain homogeneously. Amyloid builds up in some parts of the brain far more severely and early in the course of Alzheimer's disease. And other parts actually remain completely un- um, invaded by this thing called amyloid. In fact, parts of the motor cortex, for example, or parts of the visual cortex, you see almost no amyloid in, in, uh, in our Alzheimer's patients. And that's probably the reason why their motor functions and their vision is, is unchanged. But one of the, the, one of the earliest places where beta amyloid builds up and then builds up most severely in late stages is back again in that medial prefrontal cortex that sits right there in between the eyes. Why was I interested in that? I was interested is because when we were doing studies where we would map with all of these electrodes over your head, we would map the deep sleep that you were having. And we could do some clever mathematical modeling of those deep sleep brainwaves. And we could try to triangulate where was the electrical epicenter of those electrical deep brainwaves of deep sleep. And it seems as though they come from all over the brain, but the principal epicenter that generates your deep sleep sits right there in the middle part of the prefrontal cortex. It is exactly the same part of the brain that accumulates toxic beta amyloid protein. Uh -huh. Then we'd done studies, and other people had done studies before us, that demonstrated as we age, our sleep gets worse. But not just any type of sleep, especially that deep quality of sleep that we know and we spoke about is critical for saving and learning and retaining new memories. So all of these jigsaw pieces started to get put together in, in, in my head and I thought, we need to do some studies. Is it possible that 
the amount of amyloid that you have in the brain in this sleep generating center, it should directly predict the deficit in the amount of deep sleep that you get. If it predicts the deficit in the amount of deep sleep, it should predict the deficit in your ability to hold on and retain new memories, which is a, a hallmark cognitive feature of Alzheimer's disease, difficulty learning, difficulty retaining. So we did the study and that's exactly what we found. The more beta amyloid that builds up in this central frontal part of the brain, the less the deep sleep that you have. The less amyloid related deep sleep that you had, the more forgetful you were the next day rather than the more that you remembered. So this was the first part of the Alzheimer's sleep equation, which is that Alzheimer's disease attacks the deep sleep generating regions and you have a dim diminution of deep sleep, which in turn blunts your learning and memory abilities and you become more forgetful. A far more important discovery was made by an another group, um, uh, far more important than the one we made, which was essentially the reverse direction, which was to say, um, rather than amyloid sort of decreasing sleep, could sleep actually decrease the amount of amyloid that you get? And this was a discovery that was made in rats back in um, 2009, I believe was the first um, evidence that was published in science. Um, and this is um, uh, a colleague, Dr. Nedergarden, who is out um, on the East Coast uh, at the University of Rochester. And she made, this, she made two wonderful discoveries. The first was that we've known for a long time the body has a waste sewage system called the lymphatic system. But the brain doesn't have its own lymphatic system. The, the lymphatic system does not penetrate the brain. So what, where does all of the, the garbage, the metabolic garbage go that your brain cells produce? Where's the sewage system for the brain? And she discovered it. It's actually made up of a set of cells called glial cells which are these supporting brain cells. And so she called it the glymphatic system rather than the lymphatic system. So your brain does have a sewage system, this glymphatic system. And that's the discovery that she made. Remarkable. Then, and I'm not quite sure what motivated her to do this, she started to measure how efficient that glymphatic, that waste system was when the rats were awake and when the rats were asleep. And what she found was that it's during deep sleep that these brain cells actually shrink by almost 60% when we sleep. Blows my mind. Yeah. It's almost like you know, all of the buildings in New York all of a sudden shrink, and it leaves these much greater large areas for the cleaning crews to come in and clean up all of the metabolic detritus of the city's activity during the day. That's exactly what happens during sleep. And the, the cleaning solution is what we call cerebrospinal fluid. And the, through a pulsatile mechanism during sleep, you get a 10 to 20% increase in the bathing of cerebrospinal fluid, fluid through the brain, which washes away all of the metabolic um, uh, byproducts that have been building up. One of those metabolic byproducts is beta amyloid. And in fact, if you deprive those rats of that deep sleep, you immediately get an increase in toxic beta amyloid. So now we've linked these two. I'm sorry, it's a long story, but if you're not getting enough deep sleep at night, you're not giving yourself the chance for the kind of good night and sleep clean process to remove the beta amyloid. So more beta amyloid builds up. Where does it build up? Tragically, in the very same regions of the brain that generate the deep sleep that you need to clear out the toxic amyloid. So you start getting less deep sleep, so you get more toxic protein, more toxic protein, less deep sleep, less deep sleep. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it's a non-linear exponential curve. If you look at how amyloid builds up in the brain, and if you look at the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease, it is a non-linear exponential curve. It fits exactly what the sleep-dependent model of amyloid clearance would predict if you're not getting sufficient sleep. That's the reason why now insufficient sleep seems to be one of the most significant lifestyle factors determining that. Now, you could say, by the way, those studies were in rats and you deprive them of sleep for one night. What about humans? Like, surely, well, the study has now been done. Great study done out of WashU by um, a, a team of scientists there 
um, led by David Holtzman. And they took a group of, of humans and they did this very clever method where they deprived them of deep sleep, but they didn't deprive them of sleep. And you think, uh, it sounds paradoxical. Um, I can play you these auditory tones. Now, this is not like the memory reactivation mm -hmm. where that you play a tone and then you leave the brain alone for a while. Here, I'm just going to keep playing tones to your brain, really uh, sort of annoying tones. But I can play them at a level that doesn't wake you up, but it lifts you out of deep sleep and keeps you in shallow sleep. Mm -hmm. So what's delightful about this method is that I can selectively excise one type of sleep, deep sleep, but I don't wake you up. So there's no stress of awakening. You are asleep for the same amount of time, but the quality of sleep is decreased. Can street noise do that? We don't know. Although I will come back to that when we speak about hopefully sleep appetite regulation, okay. sleep glucose regulation, and sleep in low socioeconomic cultures. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the, it's possible there's a link. I think there's other factors that link poor sleep in low SES socioeconomic backgrounds. Is noise pollution one of them? I actually think it is un, untested as yet. But what they did with these human uh, participants, they selectively removed deep sleep while keeping them asleep. So total sleep time was not changed. <laughs> and then in the morning, they woke them up, they rolled them over, and they did a spinal cord puncture, a lumbar puncture, and they measured the cerebrospinal fluid that was percolating within the spinal cord, which also goes around the brain. And you can measure the amount of beta amyloid, which is a reflection of perhaps how much amyloid is there within the brain. After one night of essentially a loss of deep sleep, you saw an immediate rise in the amount of beta amyloid. So it is a causal manipulation that insufficient sleep in rodents and in humans will lead to a rise in beta amyloid. Yeah. I think it was like 25 to 30%. It was. It was, yeah, it's definitely. Yep.